chapter 13 it's about the spinal cord and spinal reflexes spinal cord is very important and it provides a way to communicate with the brain and the lower body so uh, some of the functions of the spinal cord will be conduction with these uh, nerve fibers that we have inside the spinal cord, we can bring sensory and motor information up and down the spinal cord. And this is very important for the movement of muscles or for bringing sensory information into the brain. Now within the spinal cord also, we have uh, areas that are important to make sense of the information or integrate this information and to produce uh, an exit of information that is going to lead to an action within an organ. So we have, uh, for instance, the bladder control. We integrate this uh, information within the spinal cord. Also within the spinal cord, uh, we have locomotion uh, as a function because Within the spinal cord, we have uh, generators of central patterns that helps to coordinate the repetitive movements for uh, the contraction of our muscles in our legs so we can walk. Now, we also produce some reflexes, which are defined as involuntary ref uh, ref responses or reflexes that uh, are vital for posture, coordination and protection. Within the spinal cord, we have uh, this nervous tissue in the middle that it comes from the brainstem, the, one of the most lower parts of the, of the brain. And then this is located at the foramen magnum of the occipital bone. The brainstem it occupies two thirds of the vertebral canal, the one that is enclosed by the vertebral body and the vertebral arch. And then it ends at the level of L1 or L2. In thickness, it has an average of 1.8 centimeters and it has around 45 centimeters in length. Within the spinal cord, we have the spinal nerves that exits, we have 31 pairs. And then some of these pairs, they will merge and they form plexuses. Now we have functional segments of the spinal cord that are supplied by each pair of the spinal nerves. For the surface of the spinal cord, so we have two long groups that are longitudinal, so they run along the length of the spinal cord. One is anterior and one is posterior, and their proper name will be anterior median fissure and posterior median sulcus. The segments or the regions into which the spinal cord is subdivided are cervical, the one that located in the neck, thoracic, the one that is located uh, in the thorax, lumbar, just below the thorax, and sacral, just below the lumbar area. Within the spinal cord, we have a couple of areas that are enlarged, the cervical and the lumbar area. Why they are enlarged? Well, because we uh, have nerves emerging from the spinal cord that are going to provide innervation or function into the arms in the cervical enlargement and then for the legs with the lumbar enlargement and also for the pelvic region. Now the spinal cord ends in the medullary cone or conus medullaris. This is an area where the cord tapers and then it ends in a point that uh, is inferior to the lumbar enlargement. Out of this medullary cone, we have bundle of nerves roots that are known as the cauda equina, and they run between 
L2 or lumbar 2 and S5 or sacral 5. So here is the posterior view of the spinal cord. So it starts here at the foramen magnum and ends here at uh, L1 or L2. And then we have uh, here the conus medullaris and out of the conus medullaris we have the cotechina that helps to prevent and, and, and connects this uh, spinal cord to the sacrum and it helps to prevent the spinal cord from shortening as we uh, walk or as we move. So uh, here is the cervical region, thoracic region, lumbar, and then this is the sacral region. Within the cervical area, we have the cervical enlargement. Within the lumbar area, we have the lumbar enlargement. And then coming off from the cervical area, we have the cervical spinal nerves coming up from the thoracic area, the thoracic, thoracic spinal nerves, and then coming up from the lumbar area, the lumbar spinal nerves, and then coming up from the sacral area, we have the sacral spinal nerves. If you magnify this region and you're sitting here, you will be able to see these rootlets or tiny roots that makes up this uh, spinal cord. The spinal cord is protected by three membranes that are called meninges. And these three membranes also continue up into the brain and it also protects the brain. So we have meninges in the brain and in the spinal cord. And from superficial to deep, these meninges or membranes are called the dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater. Now the dura mater is the most toughest membrane, is the thickest and most protective, and it is separated from the vertebrae by a space that we call epidural space. Remember, epi means above. And then just below the dura mater, we have the second layer uh, or, or meningi that we call the arachnoid. And the arachnoid will send uh, connective tissue into the dura and it will form a space that we call the subarachnoid space. And this subarachnoid space is important because we have this fluid that is called cerebrospinal fluid or CSF that helps to moisturize and protect the central nervous system. So whenever we require to make a study of the cerebrospinal fluid, like when someone perhaps might have an infection in the central nervous system, like meningitis, you have to do a tap or an extraction, uh, 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 spinal tap or an extraction of the CSF, and you have to introduce a needle into the subarachnoid space. Now, underneath the subarachnoid space uh, or the dura mater, sorry, yeah, uh, the pia, sorry, uh, underneath the uh, arachnoid, we have the pia mater, which is a very thin membrane that contacts directly the spinal cord and it continues uh, inferiorly into the conus medullaris and makes this thin filament that we call that terminal film. And this is going to fuse with the dura mater to form a strong ligament that we call a coccygeal ligament. So this is a transverse cut of the spinal cord in here, in the middle. And then the spinal cord is surrounded by uh, the meninges. So <coughs> this is anterior, this is posterior. Here you have the spinous process of the vertebrae. This is the body of the vertebrae. And then in here we have a transverse process. So what you can see here is this uh, structure, which is the spinal cord with the gray matter in the middle, white matter surrounding. Gray matter is made out of neurons. Gray, uh, 
white matter is, is made out of axons, my, myelinated axons, so tracks of these axons. And then this little membrane that you see here depicted in pink is the pia matter. And then <coughs> in here we have the subarachnoid space. And then in here we have the dura matter. And then here we have the epidural space occupied by fat. <coughs> and then emerging from the spinal nerve, uh, sorry, from the spinal cord, we have the spinal nerves that uh, join in here and they form a mixed nerve. <coughs> So uh, this is an anterior view of the spinal cord. So uh, here you can see the fissures or uh, the, the uh, grooves of the spinal cord. So this is the anterior median fissure. This is the posterior median sulcus. And then in here we have, again, the gray matter with uh, a space here that we call the central canal that helps for circulating CSF. And then we have here the anterior horns of the gray matter, posterior horn of the gray matter, and lateral horns of the gray matter. And then here within this uh, anterior region, you can see also uh, the meninges in here. This is the pia matter, this is the arachnoid, and then this is the dura matter. And as any other organ, the, the uh, spinal cord has to have its own blood supply. So here we have the arteries and the veins of the spinal cord. And then these will be rootlets that they join, they merge, and they, they form an anterior root of a spinal nerve and a posterior root of the spinal nerve that both will merge and then they will form a spinal nerve. So the spinal nerve then has an anterior root and a posterior root. This is also known as dorsal root. This is called ventral root, the anterior. And this one, the anterior root, brings motor information into the glands or muscles, skeletal muscles of our body. While this one, the dorsal root, brings sensory information from the receptors that we have within the peripheral structures in our body into the spinal cord. So dorsal root and dorsal horns are related to sensory functions. So, so what we feel, touch, if it's uh, rough, if it's smooth, whatever you're touching, if it's hot, if it's cold, and then uh, sensor, well, any kind of sensory information. Now, for the anterior root, you will send a command into your muscle so you can contract whatever muscle in your body you you want to contract if it's a skeletal muscle and then here we have the posterior root ganglion which has uh, the body of the neurons for this posterior uh, spinal nerve or uh, posterior part of the spinal nerve or root some uh, congenital problems of the spinal nerve are something that we call spina bifida, in which uh, you have an incomplete closure of the uh, vertebral arch. It happens in one in every 1,000 uh, verts, and it's very common to find it within the lumbar, lumbar area. And uh, it has different types of severity, we have the most serious form that we call the spina bifida cystica. And uh, at some point, uh, intake of folic acid, which is a type of vitamin B, uh, it reduces the chances of having spina bifida. Uh, so females, when they're pregnant, they're supposed to take uh, folic acid. And then the defect occurs during the first four weeks of development. So uh, the folic acid supplements for mothers must begin three months before conception. So even if you're not pregnant, you're supposed to uh, take uh, spinal cord, uh, sorry, uh, 
take uh, folic acid to prevent spinal cord defects like this one. So this is a spina bifida cystic. Okay, so uh, for the components of the uh, spinal cord itself, so we have the gray matter, which has the neurons, and then these neurons uh, have their cell body there without any myelin. This is an area where you have processing of the information that comes into the spinal cord, and then you have synapses there or connections with other neurons. And then the white matter is an area that is surrounding the gray matter, protecting it, and it's an area where we have tracks or axons forming a bundle that can come up and down the spinal cord, bringing information up into the spine, uh, up from the spinal cord into the brain, or down from the brain into the spinal cord. So this is a cross section of the spinal cord showing you this gray matter, and then the white matter. And then we have the ependymal canal or central canal in here. And you already seen this before. So uh, the shape of the gray matter, it's like an H, H shape or a butterfly. It has these extensions that are called the dorsal horns posteriorly and the ventral horns arteriorly. <coughs> and I already told you that within the anterior root of the spinal nerve, we have motor fibers that help to move the muscles. And then uh, we have uh, in the posterior root, the dorsal, uh, the sorry, the sensory uh, neurons. Now the lateral horns, the, the ones that are on the sides in between the ventral and dorsal roots, they are only found between T2 and L1. And they contain neurons of the sympathetic nervous system. So uh, the actual tracks that uh, runs within the white matter are called columns or funiculi. And then we have uh, three columns or funiculi. So we have posterior, lateral, and anterior. And then we have tracts or fasciculi that are subdivisions of each of these columns. So the spinal tracts, there are fibers in a given tract and have similar origin, destination, and function. It's not like they start in the same place and they go everywhere. No, they have to follow along and continue into their uh, destination and they have uh, the same function. So ascending tracks will bring sensory information into the brain while the descending tracks bring motor information from the brain down into our muscles. And then some of these uh, fibers will cross the midline and this is called decusation. And then uh, we can have something that we call contralateral, in which the origin and destination of a track are on opposite sides of the body, while ipsilateral will be when the origin and the destination are on the same side of the body because they don't cross or they don't decusate. So in here in this diagram, uh, they depicted the ascending tracks in uh, red, while the descending tracks in uh, in green. So here we have this posterior column that is subdivided into the gracile fasciculus and cuneate fasciculus. Just on one side, or medial, actually I should say medial, to the uh, dorsal horn. And then here lateral, just uh, in between the ventral and the dorsal horn, we have this lateral track what, uh, that it is subdivided into posterior spinocerebellar 
and anterior spinocerebellar tract. And then we have uh, this, that it is called the anterior or anterolateral system. That it has uh, some fibers that are called spinothalamic fibers or tract, and then a spinoreticular tract. And at some point, uh, some of the names of these tracts will indicate where they're coming and where they're going. So in the case of the spinocerebellar, they go from the spinal cord into the cerebellum, and in the case of the spinothalamic, they go from the spinal cord into the thalamus. Now for the descending tract, we have lateral cortical spinal tract and lateral reticulospinal tract in here and tectospinal tract in here. Now these ones are descending, so this name, corticospinal, that means that it comes from the cerebral cortex into the spinal cord. And then <coughs> this one, uh, the tectospinal tract, comes from an area of the brain that's called the tectum into the uh, spine, into the spinal cord. And then we have here medial reticulospinal tract, and then we have lateral vestibulospinal tract and medial vestibulospinal tract, and then in here, just next to this fissure, we have the anterior cortical spinal tract. So uh, the ascending tracts, when they bring the information into the brain, they use three neurons. The lower neuron is called the first order, and then it brings the uh, a stimulus from the receptors in the different parts of our body that we have, and then it will transmit it into the spinal cord or the brainstem. And then this first order neuron is going to connect with the second most up neuron, which is called the second order neuron, that it will uh, connect this first order neuron and bring the information into the thalamus at an area of the brain that we call the upper end of the brainstem. And actually the thalamus, it, it's, a, it's part of the uh, brain. Now the third order neuron will connect this second order neuron, is the most upper neuron, into the uh, cerebral cortex. So it will connect the thalamus into the cerebral cortex. And then, <coughs> uh, then the thalamus will act as a filter. Not all the information that you are receiving right now from the environment, it will be important for uh, your cerebral cortex to, to know or, or, or to be aware of. So the cerebral cortex is actually where we interpret uh, and uh, be, be aware of what is happening. Okay, so all of these then that you see here are uh, ascending tracks and they bring different information into the brain. So the gracile fasciculus will bring information from the mid-thorax and lower parts of the body into the medulla oblongata. What type of information? It's going to bring information about vibration, visceral pain, deep and discriminative touch, proprioception from the lower limbs and the lower trunk. Proprioception, it's a term that uh, tells us that uh, we have the ability to know what is the, dif the different uh, position of the parts of our body. So even if you close your eyes, you know that you're, uh, if you're sitting, that your head is up and then that your uh, feet are down in the ground. So that's proprioception. Cuneate fasciculus, it's... Um, a tract that starts at T6 and above, so at the mid thoracic level and above, and then it is found at the lateral portion of the posterior column just next to the uh, gracile fasciculus. And then it's going to bring the sensory information from the upper limb and the chest into the medulla oblongata. 
And then uh, the second order neurons of the Garcial and Cunate uh, fasciculus are going to cross and they are going to form a structure that is called the medial lemniscus that is going to bring information into the thalamus. And then from there, the thalamus will connect into the cerebral cortex using this third order neuron. And due to this crossing of the second order neurons, the left hemisphere is going to process a stimuli from the right side of the body and the left side is going to bring information into the right cerebral hemisphere or the right half of the brain. And, and the type of information that cuneate fasciculus detects is the same as the uh, Brazil fasciculus, is vibration, discriminative touch, etc. Spinothalamic tract. <coughs> This is uh, part of the anterior lateral system. So we have uh, anterior spinothalamic tract, lateral spinothalamic tract. Independently, if it's anterior or, or lateral, uh, spinothalamic tract brings information into the brain, such as pain, pressure, temperature, light touch, fecal, and itch. The tract is made out of, of the axons of second order neurons. And then the first order neurons will enter in the posterior horn of the spinal cord. So you have all these uh, nerve fibers that detect pain, pressure, temperature, light touch, fecal, and itch, and then goes into the posterior horn of the spinal cord and connects to the spinothalamic tract. And then as the spinothalamic tract is receiving this information, it will cross immediately to the opposite side. And then your third order neurons will continue there bringing that information into the cerebral cortex. So uh, here is a diagram to show you some of these uh, ascending uh, tracks. So <coughs> In here, we have gracile and cuneatus uh, fasciculus. So when you receive this information from these receptors of the body uh, that detects body movement, proprioception, impositions, touch, discrimination, and pressure, this information enters through the posterior part of the spinal cord into the dorsal horns or posterior horn. And then from, the inf from there, the information goes up in the spinal cord through the gracile or the cuneate fasciculus. If it's uh, in the lower part of the body, it will be through the gracile fasciculus, but if it's uh, fasciculus, but if it's on the upper part of the body, it will be through the cuneate fasciculus. They go up. They, s they uh, reach this area in the medulla, the upper area to the spinal cord, and then they will cross. And then they make connection with this second order neuron. The second order neuron will form this uh, structure that we call the medial lemniscus in the midbrain. And then from there, the information will reach into the thalamus. And the thalamus is going to filter this information and then it's going to send it into the cerebral cortex into an area that we call somesthetic cortex, the area where we detect uh, this uh, touch discrimination, uh, the position of our body uh, parts, etc. Now for the spinothalamic tract, you have these receptors for pain, heat, temperature, etc., connected to these first order neurons. And then they will uh, sense this information, bring it into this first order neuron that it is connected to the dorsal horn. And then immediately they cross or decusate. And then they can go into the uh, spinothalamic tract 
with the second order neuron and then from there you bring the information into the thalamus and then the thalamus will send that information into this uh, third order uh, sorry into the cerebral cortex through this third order neuron so ascending tracks or pathways they have three neurons the lower neuron that is called first order the second that connects to the first here this is the second order neuron and then it has a third order neuron always between the thalamus and the cerebral cortex the spinal reticular tract travels up the anterior lateral system as well as the uh, anterior lateral spinothalamic tract it will carry signals of pain that results from tissue injury and it's made up of axons of second order neurons so when you receive uh, an injury in your body your first order neurons will detect through its receptors this uh, pain and then this pain information is going to be brought immediately into the second order neurons and then the second order neurons will cross and they will ascend and ends into the reticular formation which is uh, in a structure that it has neurons that are located between the medulla oblongata and the pons and then uh, these uh, neurons are loosely organized <coughs> and then they would connect into third order neurons that continues from the pons into the thalamus and then you will have a fourth order neuron that will connect the thalamus into the cerebral cortex now for the spinal cerebellar tracts we have two we have anterior and posterior that are located on the lateral column in the very edge of the uh, white matter if you recall and they will bring information of proprioception basically our body position but especially from the limbs and the trunk and then this bring this information into the cerebellum so we can uh, coordinate body movements such as when we are walking so we don't fall so they are made out of axons of second order so the first order neuron will be uh, located within muscles and tendons and then they will extend their axons they connect into the posterior horn of the spinal cord and then this uh, will come and make a synapse with the second order nerves into the anterior and posterior spinocerebellar tract and then when they bring that information into the cerebellum posterior spinocerebellar tract it always stays on the same side so it's ipsilateral while the anterior one will decussate or cross over and travel up into the opposite side but it will cross back to end in the same side of the cerebellum okay so uh, now let's talk about the motor tracks or descending tracks so they can bring information uh, from the brain uh, into the brain stem or into the spinal cord and we only have two neurons in here the neuron that connects the brain to the brain stem or the spinal cord that is called the upper motor neuron and then this upper neuron, motor neuron will connect to the lower motor neuron that will exit anteriorly through the ventral horns and it will connect to the muscle or other target organ <laughs> so this is a descending pathway the corticospinal tract again its name implies that it comes from the cerebral cortex into the uh, spinal cord so these corticospinal tracts help us to finally coordinate our movements and uh, they form these reaches 
on the anterior part of the medulla oblongata that we call the pyramids. Now, <coughs> these pyramids are formed by the crossing over of fibers from the corticospinal tract that come from the right side and crosses to the left, and from the left side that crosses to the, to the right. So, and then when they, they reach uh, these fibers, the uh, lower motor neuron, and they make the synapse, they send the signal into whatever muscle you want to move, then you will be moving one side of your body with the opposite side of your brain. So if you're moving your left leg, you will be moving and sending commands uh, by uh, sending s these commands with the right side of the brain and vice versa. Now some fibers, uh, they, they can descend in the ipsilateral side of the spinal cord and they can decusate inferiorly like, uh, like lateral tract and they ultimately control uh, lateral muscles. So here is the corticospinal tract. So they, they start with the upper motor neuron, and this upper motor neuron, they bring this information down into the uh, brain stem or into the spinal cord, and this descending pathway will reach different areas of the brain and then ultimately they will make these synapses and <coughs> it will cross over here part of the fibers in the medulla into what we call the pyramids and some other ones they will not cross I at this area they will continue ipsilaterally but they will cross over once they reach a specific segment. No matter what, you always control movement of one side of the body with the opposite side of the brain. More descending pathways. We have tecto tectospinal tract that it starts at the midbrain, the tectum, and they cross to contralateral side of the midbrain. And then uh, we control with this tectospinal tract movement of the head. So whenever you hear a loud sound, loud sound, for instance, in the in the right side of your body, by reflection you turn to the right. You won't turn to the left, okay? Because you have this information sent through the tectospinal tract. So it reflects turning of the head in response to sights or sounds. Now the lateral and medial reticulospinal tracts, they originate in the reticular formation of the brain stem and they help to control muscles of the upper and lower limbs, especially those that are in charge of posture and balance. So uh, they also have uh, some descending analgesic pathways that will help to reduce the transmission of, of pain signals to the brain. So they are very important analgesic pathways. And then we have also a couple of descending tracts that are the lateral and the medial vestibular spinal tracts that starts at the brainstem in a region of the brainstem that we call the vestibular nuclei. And they will receive this signal from the inner ear that it is in charge of balance through this vesti vestibular, uh, vestibular tract of cranial nerve number eight, and they will help to control the tone of the extensor muscle. So whenever uh, you are about to lose balance, you increase your tone of your extensor muscles and you prevent falling. Okay, so that's the information about uh, <coughs> the spinal cord when it comes to the ascending and descending pathways, uh, the internal components of the spinal cord. Now the spinal cord also uh, forms these spinal nerves that helps to communicate the uh, 
uh, periphery of the body with the central nervous system. And in the and remember, the spinal cord itself is part of the central nervous system. So a nerve can be defined defined as uh, a cord-like organ that has numerous nerve fibers or ac or axons that are bound together by connective tissue. <coughs> and mixed nerve fibers have afferent or sensory information or arriving information sensory or efferent or effector or motor uh, information or exiting information. So uh, the nerve fibers of the PNS, they are surrounded by the Schwann cells that are going to myelinate some of these uh, nerve fibers and the nerves, they have this connective tissue. So the loose connective tissue that it is just external to the plasma membrane of a nerve is called the endoneurum. The perineurum will surround fascicles or bundles of nerve fiber and the epineurum will wrap a complete nerve fiber. So endoneurum will bind to the individual nerve fibers, while perineurum will bind bundles of nerve fibers and epineurum a complete nerve. And then we have blood vessels that are located in between these connective tissue that provides blood supply to the nerves. So sensory nerves will carry always information from sensory receptors in the periphery of our body into the central nervous system, while motor fibers or efferent fibers will carry signals from the central nervous system to the muscles and the glands. And mixed nerve nerves have both motor fibers and sensory fibers. Now, sensory and motor fibers can be subclassified as somatic or visceral. Somatic if they control the movement of the skeletal muscle, visceral if they control the movement of smooth muscle within internal organs, and general or special. General information or general sensory information will be that information that uh, is not special uh, for instance, uh, discrimination of touch, uh, temperature, pain is not special, it's general sensory information. And a special information will be uh, taste, uh, <coughs> olfaction, seeing, hearing, and balance. Now, the nerves uh, of the central nervous system are clustered into organs that we call nuclei, while the neurons of the peripheral nervous system are clustered into what we call ganglia. So within the posterior region of our spinal cord, just outside, we have posterior root ganglia that has the neuronal bodies of the sensory nerves. For the spinal nerves, we have 31 pairs, uh, which are mixed nerves. So we have eight cervicals, C1 to C8. First cervical exits between occipital bone and the atlas, or C1, and the other exits at the intervertebral foramina. So we have uh, besides those eight cervical, we have 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal. And this is how you uh, give their name, uh, similar to the, or numbering, uh, similar to the ones for the spinal column, the vertebrae. So here is how the nerves form. So we have here, anterior region of the spinal cord, posterior region of the spinal cord. So we have here the rootlets of 
the anterior root and the rootlets of the posterior root. Both roots, posterior and anterior, merge and they form a spinal nerve. And only the posterior root has a root ganglion in here. Now, uh, this is the uh, cross section of then of the spinal nerve showing you the different connective tissues uh, that surrounds this uh, nerve fiber. So here we have and myelinated nerve fibers, and here we have myelinated nerve fiber. And then we have this membrane, the endoneurum, surrounding this nerve fiber, individual nerve fiber. Several of these nerve fibers, they form bundles, and these will be surrounded by perineurium. So it's here it's another perineurium, another perineurium. And then several bundles or fascicles they form a complete nerve, and then we have surrounding the complete nerve this membrane that we call epineurium. So it's basically similar as to the uh, protection of the uh, muscle, the skeletal muscle, the membranes. And then you can see here that this uh, connective tissue, these membranes that protect the nerve, helps to bring these blood vessels so that the nerves can have their own blood supply. If you take a magnification of this area where you have the dorsal ganglion, you can see the bodies of the neurons of the dorsal ganglion. So they extend this axon. And these will be sensory fibers or afferent or arriving. And in the anterior root, we have efferent fibers or motor fibers or exiting. And then when they connect here, they form a spinal nerve. And you can see here in this view of the uh, cervical area how these uh, spinal roots exits here in between these openings that we call the intervertebral foramen. So I already told you that uh, the spinal nerves are formed by two roots or proximal branches, the posterior and anterior branches. They merge and they form this uh, spinal nerve. And each of them, these roots, they have six to eight rootlets. And then <coughs> at the end of the spinal cord between L1 and L2, more precisely like L2, you have the formation of several roots that emerge from the conus medullaris that we call the cauda And the cauda will form uh, these spinal nerves between L2 to C01 or coccygeal one. So here we have C1 to C8, and then we have T1 to T12, L1 to L5, S1 to S5, and then we have here the last one, which is coccygeal one. <coughs> And uh, as you can see here, some of these nerve fibers, the spinal nerves, they will merge and they form what we call plexus. So we have cervical plexus that is formed by uh, the roots of spinal nerve C1 to C5, and then uh, thoracic brachial plexus, the one in here, is formed by C1 to T1, C5, sorry, to one. So <coughs> cervical plexus is going to innervate uh, many of the muscles within the neck. And then this brachial plexus as uh, is uh, going down into the arm and then into the shoulder is going to provide innervation to some of these muscles within the arm and within the shoulder. And then in here we have these individual intercostal nerves, sorry, inter yeah, thoracic or intercostal nerves that are going to provide innervation to 
these intercostal muscles that you have in between the ribs. And then within the lumbar area, we form the lumbar plexus with the aid of L1 to L4 spinal nerve, and then the sacral plexus between L4 and S4. And then coccygeal plexus, S4 to C01. So, after the vertebrae, the nerves are going to form distal branches, an anterior ramus that is going to go and innervate uh, <coughs> structures within the thoracic region or other regions in the anterior area. And we form a posterior ramus that is going to innervate the muscles of the back and the skin of the back and also our joints. And then we have uh, something that we call the meningeal branch that will re-enter the vertebral canal to provide innervation to the meninges, vertebrae, and spinal ligaments. So the spinal nerve, this one that forms from the posterior and anterior dorsal, uh, sorry, roots. Okay, so it will merge, sorry, it will split forming a posterior ramus and an anterior ramus. The anterior ramus is going to provide innervation to lateral and anterior structures while the, while the posterior root is going to provide innervation to the back muscles, the skin, and joints. And then in here, since we are at the thoracic area, we have these nerves from the sympathetic system. And then we have this meningeal branch that is going to re-enter the spinal cord to provide uh, innervation to the meninges and also to the structures within this body. So you can see here a uh, cross-section of the thoracic area and how this uh, spinal nerve splits into a posterior ramus and then into an anterior ramus. And then in through this anterior ramus, we provide innervation to these lateral muscles, to the skin here, to these lateral cutaneous nerves. And then it goes here into the anterior region, innervating muscles in the anterior region, and then innervating the skin in the anterior region of our body through this anterior cut cutaneous nerve. And then this posterior ramus is going to provide innervation to our back muscles and then into the skin with this, uh, with this part, this, this nerve. And then in here again, we have a sympathetic nerve because this is the thoracic region. <coughs> so specifically cervical nerve, sorry, cervical plexus is going to provide uh, innervation or function to the neck and then it will form the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve, it's a nerve that uh, goes into the thoracic cavity and connects into the diaphragm, the muscle that separates the thoracic and the abdominal cavities. This diaphragm goes up and down helping to compress and to uh, expand the thoracic cavity so we can breathe. This is very important muscle. It's the muscle that makes us to inhale two-thirds of the air. And then C3, C4, C5 uh, roots of cervical plexus will form the diaphragm. So one way to remember is C3, C4, C5 keep the diaphragm alive. Brachial plexus is going to provide innervation to the upper limb, some of the shoulder muscles and the neck muscles. And uh, when you have uh, damage to one of these nerves formed by the brachial plexus, which is called the median nerve, you will have what we call carpal tunnel sy syndrome. Lumbar plexus is going to provide innervation to the abdominal wall, anterior thigh, and genitalia. And then Sacral plexus is going to form 
these important nerves that are going to provide innervation to the lower trunk and lower limb, including the sciatic nerve, the greater sciatic nerve. And then coccygeal plexus, which is made by S4, S5, and CO1, are going to innervate the structures within the uh, medial lower part of our luteal area. Okay, so uh, the nerve plexus then provides somatosensory function because they bring sensory signals from bones, joints, and muscles, and skin into the central nervous system. So uh, proprioception again is the perception of the body position and body movements that is coming from receptors that we have within the muscles, the tendons, and the joints. And then motor function, it is achieved by uh, stimulating uh, several uh, lower motor neurons that connect into the muscle fibers so that you can have uh, muscle contraction. So here is the uh, examples of how the cervical plexus form these different nerves that you can see here. Okay, so <coughs> you have uh, supraclavicular nerves in here, phrenic nerve coming from roots of C5, C4, and C3. So C3, C4, C5 form the phrenic nerve. All of these are part of the cervical plexus, brachial plexus. Uh, you can see here the subdivision. So you have these roots that when these roots, they join, they s the roots of C5, C6, they, f they form this trunk. And then uh, the <coughs> root of C7, it forms its own trunk. The roots of C8 through T1, they form this trunk. And then <coughs> several of these roots, they form a nerve that is called long thoracic nerve that runs somewhere in here. And then these roots are going to divide into anterior divisions, into posterior divisions here in blue, and then they will form cords. And these cords ultimately will form all of these nerves. So we have in here, the musculocutaneous nerve in here. We have this median nerve in here that runs next by the shaft of the humerus. We have this radial nerve in here that runs on the radial side of our arm and forearm. And then we have this ulnar nerve in here. And then the median nerve runs all the way in the middle down into our wrist. So when someone has wrist problem, inflammation of the wrist, it will compress this nerve and it will form what we call a carpal tunnel syndrome. Lumbar plexus, it's uh, in here and it forms all of these nerves, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, etc. And then a uh, greater sciatic nerve is formed by the sacral plexus that you can see here. The sciatic nerve is formed by L5, S1, and S2 by the posterior divisions, not the anterior divisions. Posterior divisions are in blue, anterior divisions are in green. Anterior divisions of L4 through S3, they form tibial nerve, for instance. Okay. Now, uh, then these nerves, they provide information or innervate a specific areas of the skin. These are known as dermatomes. And a dermatome map will be a diagram of the cutaneous regions innervated by each spinal nerve. And some of these dermatomes can overlap as much as 50% on their edges. And 
they are necessary to know because sometimes when you need to anesthetize uh, in a specific region of the body, you need to know this map so you can anesthetize above the area where this dermatome stuck. So you can have a total loss sensation. So here is a dermatome map showing you, for instance, where C2 innervates, where C3, etc. So when you have uh, these dermatomes in here, you can also predict what can be the nerve that it is damaged. For instance, if someone is uh, pinching in the skin in the lateral part of this region of the leg and the person cannot feel that, S1 might be affected. If someone suffers an accident at uh, the lumbar area and breaks one of the vertebrae and this vertebrae affects the spinal cord, the person might lose sensation or motor information from that area and below, from L1 and below. Okay, now let's talk about reflexes. So reflexes are defined as quick, involuntary stereotype reactions of glands or muscle upon a stimulation. So in order to have a reflex, then you have to have this stimulation. So they are not spontaneous, but they are responses to sensory input. And they have to be quick because they, they send sensory information right away into the central nervous system where you have interneurons and then you have another neuron that connects to this interneuron, which is the efferent pathway that is going to bring this information immediately into the effector and then you can see the response. And then they are involuntary because uh, it happens uh, without input of the CNS, uh, the brain specifically, and they are usually a stereotype. So basically they have uh, the same uh, pattern every time that you elicit this reflex. So <coughs> we have uh, reflexes that include secretion uh, by glands and also contraction by the three types of muscle. And then somatic reflexes are specific reflexes that happens within the uh, somatic nervous system, the one that innervates the, the skeletal muscles. So reflexes occurs in arcs. So you have to stimulate, uh, in the case of somatic reflexes, a somatic receptor. The somatic receptors will be located in the skin, muscles, or tendons, and then these somatic receptors will have these afferent nerve fibers that will bring this information into the posterior uh, horn of the spinal cord or into the brainstem. And then the posterior horn or the brainstem acts as an interpreting or inter integrating system that are going to send a signal into these efferent nerve fibers. And then you will have this motor response. So here is an example of the patellar reflex. So in here we have uh, receptors within the patellar ligament and also within the muscle fibers. So when you tap with this uh, reflex hammer, the patellar ligament, you will create a stretch within this uh, tendon. And that is going to stimulate the receptors. These receptors are connected to these afferent or sensory nerve fibers. So they're going to uh, start action potentials that are going to travel through this axon of the afferent fibers. And then it will reach us into the sensory neuron, the body of the sensory neuron within the dorsal root ganglion that is going to send the signal into the spinal cord and then you're going to have a direct connection with this efferent motor neuron that is going to stimulate the muscle fibers of, of the quadricep so you can have contraction of this quadricep and you have extension of the knee. 
and it has to be on the side where you stimulated this reflex. So it's not like you tap the right knee and then you uh, extend the left knee or the arm, etc. Okay, I seen that in a in a comic show. It looks funny, but it's not it's not the way it happens. So <coughs> these receptors that we have in the muscle are what we call the muscle spindle receptors, and then uh, they will be connected uh, to these afferent neurons together with the proper receptors that we have within the tendons. And then these muscle spindles will inform the brain of the length of the muscle and the body movement, and then the brain will send this command back into the muscles so you can correct this reflex and then you can uh, have a specific muscle tone and posture. So here is the location of these uh, receptors. So if you magnify these muscle fibers of the quadriceps, you can see these uh, these nerves in here. So these are called intram intrafusal muscle fibers, and they are surrounded by these axons, or, or these fibers from these axons. So these will be sensory nerve fibers. And then here we have these motor fibers that are called gamma and alpha. When you send the signal through these intrafusal fibers into the, into the spinal cord, they will send the signal back to these gamma motor fibers so you can start the contraction of this. So a spindle will contain seven to eight intrafusal muscle fibers within it. And then you will have a gamma motor neuron innervating the ends of these intrafusal fibers and they will form this reflex or this arch that it will help us to keep upright when standing on a boat for instance. Another type of reflex is what we call the stretch reflex or myotatic reflex and this happens when a muscle is stretched and it fights back or contracts. This also helps to maintain equilibrium and posture and your head starts to tip forward as you fall asleep and your muscles will contract to raise the head. This is an example of how we can help to maintain equilibrium and posture. And this helps to stabilize the joints by balancing the tension in extensors and flexors and smoothing uh, muscle actions. So uh, this stretch reflex uh, is primarily mediated by the brain, but you have also within the spinal cord some input that help us to uh, control this movement. Another name for the Pateva reflex is knee jerk. It's usually monosynaptic because you have only one connection between the afferent and the efferent neurons and it helps to test somatic reflexes and help to diagnose diseases. In this case, uh, you have what we call reciprocal in in inhibition because you have a reflex that prevents the muscles from working against each other by inhibiting antagonist uh, muscles when the agonists are excited. So when your extensors, your extensor muscles are active, your flexors, will be inactive. So this is then the explanation of this patellar tendon reflex. So again, you tap your patellar ligament. You will stimulate these receptors within the tendons and also within the intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindle. And then you send this signal along this afferent fiber. 
enters into the dorsal root, and then you will stimulate this alpha neuron. So you will send this signal into the quadriceps, or your quadriceps contract, and ex you have this knee jerk or extension of the knee, but at the same time, you stimulate this inhibitory neuron that is going to inhibit this alpha neuron that supplies the hamstrings. So your flexors, in this case, will be inactive while your extensor, your hamstrings will be inactive while the extensor, the quadriceps, will be active. And then the type of reflex that you, or uh, uh, signals that you have is excitatory, po excitatory postsynaptic potentials for the alpha motor neuron, while you will have, sorry, for the gamma motor neuron, while you will inhibit with these inhibitory postsynaptic potentials the alpha motor neuron. Now we also have another type of reflex that is called the flexor reflex or withdrawal reflex. This is very important uh, because it helps us to prevent injury. In the flexor reflex, you will have a quick contraction of your flexor muscles after you have an injurious stimulus. And then you will trigger the relaxation of the extensors at the same time as you are activating your flexors. This is not monosynaptic reflex, this is polysynaptic. And uh, this will help because you will be controlling uh, several muscle fibers at the same time. One example is when you touch a hot object with this uh, reflex, you will withdraw your hand immediately, okay, if you touch it with your hand. Now, the cross extensionary reflex is a uh, reflex in which you will have contraction of your stensors while you have relaxation of your flexors but in opposite limbs. And it helps us also to maintain balance. So, when someone uh, steps on a nail, the person will withdraw uh, with the bare foot, with, will withdraw the foot of the nail or, or of the floor as he was. Uh, stepping on this nail, so it will activate the flexors on that side and inactivate the extensors on that side, while it will activate the extensors on that side, on the opposite side. So flexor reflex uses ipsilateral reflex arc, whereas it will have cross extension reflex on the contralateral side. So here is this uh, figure that, sh that shows you this flexor and cross extension reflex. So in this case, stepping on the glass stimulates pain receptors on the right foot. You will activate your flexors on the right foot and then uh, because you're sending this sensory information and then you're sending this motor response into your uh, flexors on the right side. And then you will inhibit your extensors because you don't want to keep stepping on this glass because you will hurt more. So this is what happens on the right side. On the left side, you will activate your extensors and inactivate your flexors. So you will maintain equilibrium and you don't fall. So you will have more tone, more muscular tone on your left leg than in your right leg. So this is a contralateral extensor reflex. While this one, it's an ip ipsilateral flexor reflex. 
tendon reflex, it's about the tendon organs. Uh, basically, we have within the tendons these uh, proprioceptors, and uh, these are known as Golgi tendon organs, and they have these nerve fibers intertwined between the collagen fibers. So when you have uh, excessive tension in the tendon, you will elicit this tendon reflex that will inhibit the muscle from contracting strongly. So you will moderate your muscle contraction before it tears the tendon or pulls it loose from the muscle or bone so you don't detach these muscles. So here we have this uh, tendon and then within this tendon we have these tendon organs. And then whenever you uh, stimulate with tension these organs or these, fi uh, these receptors, you stimulate these nerve fibers so you will inhibit with this reflex excessive contraction of this muscle so you have a smooth movement and then you don't pull away the muscle fibers from the tendon and you don't have tearing of the tendon or detachment of the muscle fibers. Okay, so uh, just for a reminder about how important is the spinal cord. The spinal cord uh, then is very important for bringing information into the CNS, uh, upper portion into the brain, so that you can communicate sensory information from peripheral parts of the, of the body into the brain or vice versa, so you can send more information from the ba uh, brain into the uh, muscles. If someone has injury into the spinal cord, the person, depending on the type of injury, might end up uh, with paralysis or with lack of sensory information. The person might not be able to feel or he might have pain or all of the three. So uh, most of these uh, spinal cord injuries happen because someone will have a vehicle accident, 55% of them, and the highest risk of suffering uh, spinal cord trauma are the males between the ages of 16 and 35, and it happens because they break the spinal cord. So this is the end of the lecture. Uh, let me uh, give you a couple of key points that you, you will need, and then the rest I'm going to uh, tell you uh, in uh, chapter 14 uh, lecture. So spinal nerves are both motor and sensory, so they are mixed. Spinal nerves are mixed nerves because they have motor and sensory information. In the spinal in the spinal cord, a ventral root and a dorsal root will merge to form spinal nerve. Now, bacteria, viruses, traumatic brain injury will cause inflammation of the meninges and disruption of the flow of the CSF. This is called meningitis. So meningitis is disruption of the flow of the CSF caused by inflammation of the meninges due to brain injury, traumatic brain injury, or infection with viruses or bacteria. Now, if someone has, for instance, meningitis, he has the clinical manifestation for meningitis, and a spinal tap is necessary to withdraw cerebrospinal fluid or CSF, to properly diagnose the type of meningitis, a needle, it needs to be inserted within the subarachnoid space so you can withdraw a sample of CSF. Now with the other type of injuries, for uh, let's say that someone was in a car accident and suffers a whiplash injury that damages C3, T4, and C5 roots. The C3, C4, and C5 roots, since they form the phrenic nerve, 
and this will be damaged, the person will have the following consequences. So the phrenic nerve will be damaged and the person will not be able to breathe on its own. So which nerve is formed by C3, C4, and C5? Phrenic nerve. And what will be the consequences of having injury to this nerve? The person won't be able to breathe on its own. Okay, so that's all the key points that I have for uh, this chapter 13. Uh, hopefully you can see it all and uh, have a good day or have a good night, depending on when you are watching this video. Bye-bye.